Greetings, brothers and sisters. My name is Christian Berenweber. I am the chairman for Love Israel here in Australia, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program. Today, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. And joining us all the way from Israel is Dr. Baruch Corman. Welcome, Baruch. Hey, Christian. Good to see you. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you on this discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Baruch, I've already mentioned in the introduction that this uh, topic for today is to discuss the fear of the Lord, which is a very broad topic. Um, and we're going to try and condense it as much as possible in the time allowed. But um, uh, just by a way of introduction, uh, you know, we see a, a daily changing world that's overwhelmed uh, with this negativity and the COVID crisis that's affecting the whole globe. And sadly, we've seen a large portion of the believers, not all, but a large portion of the believers, unfortunately uh, embracing fear, just like non-believers. This is very disappointing because this pandemic, in my view, would have been an ideal opportunity for believers to share the gospel and to share what separates us between believers and unbelievers. So there is enormous amount of deception as well that we've seen in these last days um, by way of false teachers, false teachings. However, the biggest issue that we feel that we're seeing here in Australia and probably throughout the world is that fear that believers are also embracing, but also on the flip side, the lack of fear of the Lord, the fear of God. So like I said, welcome Baruch, but I want to start that Proverbs 1, 7 teaches us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instructions. Can you just share your thoughts on this and many, or maybe another scripture that you also have as well that highlights that the importance of the fear of the Lord? couple things. First of all, it's always important to look at the biblical language and many different words appear in the scripture for the word fear. In Hebrew, we have two primary words. One, yirah. Yirah is fear, but it has a connotation of priority. So biblically, that which you fear, you're going to give priority to. It's going to become the focus of your life. So in the scripture that you said from Proverbs chapter 1, when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, what the word of God is telling us is that when I make God the priority, his word becomes the purpose of my life. When I begin to submit to that, it's the beginning of knowledge. God is going to equip me with a different perspective. So the fear of the Lord draws me close to God, draws me closer to his purposes, and he supplies, he provides knowledge so that I can do the right thing and have that right perspective for seeing things correctly from his standpoint, not from the world's. There's another word, pachad in Hebrew, which pachad is the exact opposite. It's fear kind of more in how the world thinks of it. And this type of fear moves us away from the things of God because it's actually giving priority to that fear, to that wrong perspective. And it drives us away from the things of God. We don't see things from his perspective. And, and in this pandemic, the media and so many politicians are really fostering that second type of fear, which moves us away from the right way of looking at things. Right, right. I mean, and you've touched on it a little bit just then, but what, what are the dangers associated that you see that with especially believers not fearing God, not having that godly fear and reverence? Well, we're, the, in a situ we're in a situation now that's, that's problematic. I really don't know sitting here in Israel and hearing very conflicting things about this pandemic, how much to, to accept and how much not to accept. For example, last night on the Israeli news, the expert that has been put in by the Israeli government to guide the country through, he's saying that we should lessen the restrictions and simply apply them where there is evidence of a, a strong breakout in different communities, but open up the community. 
but the prime minister is is talking about a again a national shutdown so you have very mixed uh, information from leadership i strongly believe that we need to be people that first and foremost in the midst of this we think about our testimony are we behaving in a way that's pleasing to god that demonstrates we have faith my my hope's not based upon what happens to me in this world. We need to be kingdom-minded. So my focus, and I think every believer's focus should be, am I living in a way that non-believers are going to see me and find uh, comfort in, in how I'm living, uh, confidence, and notice that I see things differently than, than the world and the media, and I'm not panicking. We should never be people panicking, but I see so many churches panicking. The largest, one of the largest churches in America is led by a man, Andy Stanley in, in Atlanta, Georgia. They have already made the decision back in early July to close everything down, no group worship services until 2021. Why would you have to make that decision you know, let's put aside for a moment whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do. I think it's the wrong thing. But let's just put that aside. Why make such a decision so far in advance? Things may be very different in a month, in two months, and we can meet. Why come out? No services. I think it was highly politically motivated to be pleasing to the world rather than to think about, well, would God want us to do that? So it's, it's not having a godly perspective because there's a fear of the pandemic, pandemic rather than a fear of the Lord. Right. And, and like you've touched, I mean, we've seen some of that, not only from Andy Stanley, but other teachers as well, that even from a you know, local perspective, I've spoken to some believers not long ago that uh, they say all the right things. They, they, they share all the right scriptures about God didn't give us a spirit of fear and so forth. And, and I understand that we have to exercise some wisdom during this pandemic. I mean, it's a wisdom that we should have always adopted, washing hands and uh, being vigilant. If you've, if you've got flu-like symptoms, avoid other people. It's just common courtesy. But um, I've spoken to a few believers that they say all the right things, but then we even asked them to meet for a coffee and they were frightened. I said, oh, no, we can't go there. We, COVID is there. You know, what, what could happen? something could happen to us there. So are you seeing that as well, that some people, well, blatantly just are against scriptural um, doctrine like the Andy Stanley's of the world, but there are some that are trying to say the right things, but they really don't have that real assurance that the Lord is really watching after them. I think many people are putting more of an emphasis on science that's constantly changing rather than, yes, we wanna be prudent people. We don't wanna take foolish uh, actions that can harm someone else, but people go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Our grocery store, I live as you know, very close to, to a grocery store, my son works there. And it's not a large grocery store, but you go in there and there's always 60, 70 people between the workers and the people there. And no one says anything about it, but in a synagogue that's the same size, only 10 people can go in. Why the, 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 the discrepancy between in a grocery store, no problem, 80 people, 100 people, no, no restrictions, but in a place of worship, only 10. It's that type of, of misinformation, wrong, appropriating policy that I think that believers need to be very, very much aware of and not submissive to when they, when they discriminate against us meeting. Now, we can be very prudent in saying, okay, instead of having 100% of our norm, we'll only have 30% of the norm. And we'll practice some social distancing, but we can still meet. But in too many countries, that is reckless, they say. It's not caring. It's not loving. And you cannot do it. Some is just blatantly forbidden to do that. We need to stand against that. And we have seen that on the news here as well, that especially in the U.S. with the recent BLM movement, 
that um, you know the, the government really on certain parts of the government don't discourage others from protesting, but they do discourage them from going to church. We've, we've noticed that as well. Uh, even the Dr. Fauci was confronted a couple of days ago by a Republican uh, representative. Don't know if you saw that, but he was saying, well, you're giving a lot of recommendations. You don't stand against protesting for the Black Lives Matter pro movement, but you are definitely recommending people don't go to worship. We're seeing a little bit of that in Australia as well, but we've also I was disappointed the other day where um, they were they actually allowed an exemption for people of the Islamic faith to celebrate Eid and to congregate. Uh, and one of them was in a mosque not far away from here where they were going to have at least 400 people. Now they're promising social distancing. How they can do that in that actual area remains to be seen, but. Are you noticing that it's more targeted towards believers in Yeshua uh, than other faiths or religions? Well, being in Israel, uh, I have not seen any uh, discrimination between one religion to another. In fact, I believe across the board, the Israeli government has policies for all religious groups regardless. So I haven't seen it here in Israel, but hearing the news, reading things, in in online and such from reputable uh, sources, I do believe in America. There's been some from stark discrimination. For example, last week there was the funeral of a a very well respected civil rights uh, leader, uh, Congressman John Lewis. Yes, I thought what they did for the funeral was very appropriate. They had the the church in Atlanta where they held it, about 40, 50 percent of occupancy. They spread people out, people had masks on, and I thought it was very prudent and, and acceptable. But they were able to sing, which I think is fine for people to sing. The media had no pushback on that. But if, if on Sunday they wanted to do that same thing, that would be unacceptable and such. So it's these double standards here again. I thought the funeral was fine. I thought it should be allowed like that. I thought they were very responsible. But why isn't that same responsibility allowed on Sunday morning for, for a, a church? Yeah. That's the problem I have. And I think that we need to really stand against that and, and meet and, and defy those things. Yes, agreed. Going back to the fear of the Lord, um, I guess there's two flip sides to this coin. One is that holy fear and reverence of God himself. And the other is that, um, yes, that we shouldn't walk in fear as believers. Can you just share the distinction between the two? Because sometimes I've seen some believers, they go a little bit over the top and about, you know, not having fear of anything, but they forget that, you know, there is a godly fear that we need to demonstrate as believers. Regardless of the word that's used, the word fear has to do with behavior. And we want to have a right behavior for the situation. So the problem is if, if we fear nothing, meaning if we don't change our behavior based upon truth, instruction from God's word, and the situation, we're not demonstrating fear, biblically speaking. So we need to give God priority, but that does not mean that we just give absolutely no thought to any just common sense uh, practices. So I think very strongly that we need to be people that uh, evaluate a situation being led by the Holy Spirit, being led by the instruction of scripture, and not allow whatever is going on to, to cause us to behave inappropriately. But we need to also realize Again, it's our testimony, and we want people to. We want to have a testimony that people can see see us and want to be like us because we're like our Savior. We're like Yeshua, Jesus. So we want to behave like He behaved or would behave in a situation. That's our objective. So to believers that, and we've seen quite a few of them that they're even thinking about tomorrow and next week and next month. I mean, the Lord told us, you know, don't be anxious about anything, but there's a lot of anxiety that we're seeing. Uh, they're already thinking about, do I take the vaccine when it comes out? I mean, it's not even out officially yet, but 
could be a month, could be six months, whatever. A lot of them have fear. Do I take it? Do I not take it? Do I just trust the Lord? What would be your advice to believers that are basically going through it? And there's some very anxious moments that some of them are going through at the moment. One of the things that, that stands out in the scripture is that we're supposed to seek his face. Face, the word panim in Hebrew can mean presence. And for some people, taking the vaccine may be the wrong thing to do. Others feel very comfortable doing it. Uh, personally, I've never taken a, a flu vaccine ever in my life. I, I just don't like the, the standpoint of putting something that, that's, that's bad into your body. But I would never say that it's wrong to do that. It's an individual decision. The problem I have is that I strongly believe that it's not going to be allowed to be an individual decision. If you don't take the vaccine, you may not be able to get on a plane. You may not be able to put your kids in school and such. So my, my concern is that it's going to be decided for us by the government and it, it removes, and this is what we're seeing, a removing of, of freedoms. I think this is one of the big takeaways from the coronavirus pandemic is the government seeing how much power, power they can exert, what's going to be the pushback. I mean, so many changes politically and statements coming out because of this situation. So I strongly believe the government is, is utilizing this to, to see what they can get away with. Mm, definitely a, another agenda there. Um, even in terms of the mortality rates, which we understand that some people have lost their lives and that is tragic under any circumstance, but there's definitely another agenda there. I mean, um, now they're talking about masks being, I know that's also very relevant in the US. I don't know how relevant it is in Israel, but about the wearing of masks or not wearing of masks. We've even seen in the news, some people are getting into fights and punch-ups because they see people not wearing masks. I mean, it's, it's really getting out of control. I think that um, this is probably a prelude to what will be greater and sad to say, worse things to come, in your view? I do think it's going to uh, lay the foundation for worse things to come. In Israel, it is required everywhere. You cannot leave your, your home without a mask. It doesn't matter where you go or what you're doing. The exception is if you're going out to do sport, running, for example, or something like that, you don't need a max, max on, mask on for that. Otherwise, you do. Now, in this regard, I think that believers need to say, is it a problem? First of all, masks, well, my, my daughter just bought, I think it was 100 masks for 25 shekels, so $6. So that's very inexpensive, you know, less than uh, a 20 cents for, for a mask. I think that we shouldn't be looking for, for conflict. So wearing a mask, if it puts other people at ease, I don't know how helpful it is. I have no scientific background whatsoever. But if, if businesses want you to wear a mask to go in, I think we should respect that. We also need to be, be caring. If, if me not wearing a mask is going to cause someone else to be very concerned, then in love and, and as much as possible, the scripture says, as much as possible, live peacefully with all people. So this is something I think that, that we shouldn't be arguing about. It's, it's a simple thing to do and, and, and put it on. Um, it's not a financial problem, and if it, it can be a good testimony as well. Agree. Well, I've also noticed, I don't know whether that's, uh, you've noticed that in the US or in Israel, that unfortunately, sadly, I touched on this earlier in the, in the interview, that there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're taking a lot of advantage of believers and even non-believers. Um, you know, you look at uh, Jim Baker, I think he's now in trouble with uh, the government for, he was trying to sell some miracle cure to COVID-19. And of course it was all, all fake, but not only him, but others I see are, are really uh, adding fuel to the fire with the fear and they're, asking people to think ahead and uh, buy food that will last you five, six years, seven years and store them up. Uh, some believers, unfortunately, sadly, they're buying into that. What would you say 
to believe is that? You know, I, I think that individuals that do that have the right object, have the wrong objective, excuse me. The right objective is not to cling to life. I don't see anywhere in the scripture that we're supposed to just at all costs survive, survive, survive. And if I have food that can last me 10 years and people are hungry, I need to share it. So if people are, are getting food in order that they can help other people out, that, that may be a, a prudent thing to do. But that's not what I think that, that I hear. I hear that it's for us, for our family. We don't want to be hungry when, when the, the, there's no food out there. And I think it's just the wrong, it's a fear that's not pleasing to God. Plus, I think it's, it's really uh, assisting a, a person who may be conning individuals and profit becomes their, their, their purpose, not in really trying to do ministry. So I don't think that we should be people that, that go off the grid, that we, we have our, our, our place, our storage of all this food to get through it. I think when things get difficult, which they, they are, but they're going to get much, much worse. I'm not a prophet, but I can read prophecy. And I know that as we approach the last days, things are going to get much, much worse. And what we should be striving to do is to be utilizing this, these problems for speaking truth, giving good news, telling people how they can, can be in eternity in the kingdom of God. That should be our focus, not do I have enough food to get me through uh, whatever time period theologically that people think that they need to go through. That's not demonstrating the knowledge of the Lord. It's not loving your neighbor as yourself. It's putting you as the focus. And whenever the individual is at the focus, they are not going to be hearing from God. Right. On that same subject, with so much deception going on, you've probably noticed that there have been so many so-called prophets prophesying about the end of the virus and, you know, the likes of the Kenneth Copelands and the Benny Hins of the world that, uh, in my humble opinion, they're nothing but false prophets um, and false teachings. Once again, sadly, some people are getting roped into that. Um, and they keep changing, of course, their prophetic stances. When it doesn't come to pass, of course, then they change and they change and they change. What would you like to say to some believers that have been affected by some of these so-called prophets, false prophets and false prophecies that has led them to have more anxiety? It's, it's really tragic that, that people are desperate. Believers should never be desperate. We're supposed to have a peace that passes all understanding. We're called to have a contentment to learn the truth. The Bible says a secret about being content in all circumstances, situations. So it's, it's very disheartening for, for believers to hear about other individuals that are supposed to be followers, disciples of, of, of Christ who are panicking. Never in the Bible do we see you know, panic. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. So people need to, and I hope that maybe one of the outcomes is that people turn back to studying the word of God and realizing I uh, was speaking to someone who, who sent me an, an article about how uh, all these things, prophecies are being fulfilled. And when we look at the scripture, you know, could this be, and we've talked about this, could this be a real catalyst to move us into the last days and some very significant prophetic times? It may very well be. I mean, certainly I can't in my lifetime, I do not remember an event that has dominated the world like the coronavirus has. I think there has to be some significance in that. When we see how governments are responding, uh, making some very odd decisions, I, I think that this has significance and could lead that way. But I also know biblically that when Messiah speaks about the beginning of sorrows, these birth pangs that laid the foundation for the end times, for the rise of the Antichrist. He says that there's going to be certain things that we should be holding, pestilence in the plural. So this may be the beginning of it, but we need to see wars. We need to see greater instability, earthquake, earthquakes in number and massiveness. 
and, and factions between tribes. I know in Africa, the factions between tribes are, are rising significantly. We may be on the horizon, but I do not believe that we are in a position now that, that authoritatively we can say we're in the birth pains. We may be very close, but there's other things that have to happen. And in regard to that last seven years, a treaty needs to be signed, a, a covenant, and that has to do with the temple in Jerusalem. So I always tell people, until there's a temple in Jerusalem, we, we haven't entered into those last seven years, and there's no evidence that we can be dogmatic that we're close to it, because despite what you hear on the internet, there is no Sanhedrin in Israel. There, there is no actions being done to, to reestablish. I know people speak about the Temple Institute. They, they speak about this group that's calling themselves the Sanhedrin. But living in Israel, I can tell you that none of those things are legitimate. Okay. So in a nutshell, in summary, um, with so many anxious people out there, and I thank you for your comments and uh, making so much reference to uh, scriptures, which is basically the foundation for all us believers. Anything I, I said in an interview not long ago, anything that deviates from the word of God, from scripture, that doesn't have that good fruit, we should treat it with red flags and run the other way. So with these final thoughts, Baruch, on people that are uh, living with anxiety and still fear, we know that we have to trust God. God's on the front. He always has been, always will be. Um, mm -hmm. But what are your final thoughts? What are your final message? Well, you had sent me a verse of scripture that I think is so fitting. Uh, I believe it's the one from, from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which speaks that God has not given us a spirit of, and although most Bible translates it, fear, it's not the normal Greek word for fear. It's a word of cowardice, being timid. It's the exact opposite of, I'm sure we, we've heard the, uh, the, the expression in English, the unction of the Holy Spirit, the boldness. You know, we're supposed to be bold. We're supposed to be people that are frank, that's transparent and, and, and speak out without any uh, being timid. That's what that scripture is saying is that God does not give someone a spirit of cowardice, of being timid, of being, being shying away from the situation. He gives us boldness. And when we, we, when we embrace a spirit of timidity, tim, uh, being timid, being a coward, it, it, it removes the Holy Spirit from supplying us what he says here, power and, here's the key, love. I really believe that when we are allowing fear to, to take hold of us, we're not going to be doing the basic thing of loving our neighbor as ourself, being mindful of the ministry. I think one of the things that congregations need to focus in on is how are we doing ministry in the midst of this? This is a great opportunity to, to plan how can we minister to others, to the community, but outside the believing community, to non-believers? And, and I don't see that. I see a spirit of being timid, being cowards, being, being taken back by this, this disease, this virus, rather than being bold for the purpose of conveying to people, we have a faith that overcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your thoughts. So... For all of you who's watching here today, for any further information, you can obtain that at uh, loveisrael.org. Um, you can also watch Dr. Baruch's teachings. Uh, please check with your local stations. Here in Australia, it's available on Daystar. And also, of course, he has his YouTube channel. So I encourage you all just to go there and look at some good, sound, biblical teachings. Thank you very much, Baruch, for your time. It's very much appreciated. God bless you. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you today about these important things. Thank you.